Okay, so Stacey London, she's my guest today on my Just Jenny podcast, and I'm a fan of Stacey London's for years, not just because of what not to wear, which she did for like 10 years, but there was an article, maybe, I don't know, four or five, and, and when I actually say hello to Stacey, who's sitting right here, so I should maybe just say hi, hi. Hi. Um, you had done this article. It was about, six years ago. Is it I six know exactly years? what you're talking about. I loved it so much. It really spoke to me about what to wear because you feel like wearing it and sort of not doing what society tells you, which could have gone either way in a sense. It could have been that you were saying that you could wear a mini skirt and a midriff bearing shirt, or in your case, it was sort of like, I'm going to wear a suit. I'm going to be comfortable. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be me. And it spoke to me because I really feel like so many of us, so many of us women, as we age, get into this weird, almost crossroads where we're like, well, do I want to be pretty or do I want to feel good? Is there a way to do both? And why do I care? Like this mm. whole, it becomes almost an existential crisis. Of and, course. Right? I, and I would argue that midlife crises are called midlife crises they because just don't. it's a trope and a cliche that is true. So true. And I think it's true both in what we internalize and certainly what is thrown at us culturally. Yeah. And, you know, we don't, we give midlife short shrift. That's yeah. the first thing I'm going to say. Yeah. The article that I wrote for, it was for Refinery29. It was six so, years ago. Yeah. I was 47 at the time. And I remember that I wrote it because I had been feeling so guilty about the idea that I didn't want to wear what I wore and what not to wear, what I was known for, right? Pencil skirts and floral tops and five-inch heels. And that I thought that I would be disappointing other people because I wanted to wear three-piece suits and leather jumpsuits and get, you know, feel a little bit more um, powerful yeah. instead of sexy, right? And it's not that, I, I still think powerful is sexy, but yeah. you know, there's something about the way that we um, objectify people in culture when they are wearing, you know, body con clothing or things that are quite revealing as being objectifiable or sexualized. And I was kind of tired of that feeling. And, and maybe that had to do with my age or not, but it was really about honoring the idea that evolution is constantly happening. Our thoughts change, our taste change. Of course, our style is going to change and we should be open to that, right? Our bodies change. Yeah. So how can we accept and embrace change and not be so afraid of it just because we're used to doing one thing uh -huh. or looking a certain way? How do we evolve into an accept, an, a, a, sort of an accepting stance or an acceptance of change, just change, yeah. that nothing stays the same. Yeah. I mean, you're so right on, oh my gosh, like so many levels, because it's, it's almost as if we're, we're fighting that thing so hard because someone somewhere told us we should. I mean, I used no to wear, I mean, I went through a phase where I wore things that I look back at them and I'm like, they were too tight. They were a little, it was a little much in my early forties. I was kind of F figuring out who I was and and dancing with that like oh do I want to be hot for a small window of my life kind of thing and then mm -hmm. now at 52 I find myself buying the Frankie shop oversized blazer because you and I both own the Frankie shop oversized blazer. I mean we, we own the Zadig and Voltaire dress we I don't understand it's so clothes. crazy it's so funny to me because we have very different body types like you're long and lithe and I'm not but I I I don't want that I don't want to have to feel like I have to show my body to anybody in any way other than the way that I feel like showing my body at this age of my life, this stage of my life. But, and I but think I would, I, yeah. I would argue that you need to honor that 40 something that may have been wearing things that you think now were maybe a little too tight, right? Oh, you're, you're looking back at 2020 oh, hindsight. God, the idea is yeah. that really we have to accept what we're feeling in the moment about the way that we want to be. And the big mm. thing for me, and part of the reason, you know, I'm sure you and I will talk about this, that I've kind of moved and morphed my career from, from style more into wellness and well-being, yeah. certainly in midlife, is because I think we have been taught to fear 
midlife mm -hmm. that we won't know what to do with changing bodies for our style that we, we won't are know what even. to do with yeah. um relationships as you know uh intimacy evolves that we won't know what to do with ourselves when menopause hits or right. all of the things that scare us because we don't know enough about them and what i love to call that is innovating for the darkness right when you think something is scary, it's usually because it's something you don't understand or you can't really get your arms around or see, right? That's why we believe in monsters under the bed or in the closet because it's so dark. Yeah. But if you shine a light and you start to talk about things and you start to normalize them and you start to optimize for them, then you realize what's under the bed is just dust bunnies and some shadow, right? Yes. That makes it a lot more manageable. And what I realized is that I've been talking about style my entire life, how to dress for your body, how to control the narrative of your story by the way that you present yourself. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that is still true. We all control our own narratives because, you know, we're working with like, you know, very old software in here. We're still working with the same brain that cavemen's had. And we have cavemen's. Cave it's men's, okay. Cave mm -hmm. women, cave ladies. But this idea that you, there, it's the three second rule, right? Fight freeze or flight mm -hmm. is based on the idea that in three seconds, you make a judgment about what is in front of you. And now that our brains and our societies have, you know, changed so significantly, we're not running away from saber tooth tigers and woolly mammoths. We're making judgments about the people that we see in front of us, friend, foe, somebody I want to get to know. I like their style. Oh, she looks weird, whatever it might be, but we've got three seconds to control that narrative. That's why style is important to me. Not because we yeah. need to participate in trends. No, not no, no. because we need to portray ourselves in any particular way, whether that's powerful or boss lady or sexy or whatever. That's our choice. But what it really is about is understanding how much actual control and, and agency you have over the way that you're perceived. And I think yeah. sometimes we forget that. Take me back to... 2019, I guess it was, when you realized you were starting to go through menopause. At the time, you had a boyfriend, which yes. when I think back, I never really thought about your sexuality just because I don't really think about anybody's. I just... I, Neither I, do I. <laughs> right. Like, I don't care. And I only reference it because I know you're, now you have a partner who happens yes. to be a woman. Yes. And so that's why it's like it was then and now. And there's so there's been a lot of change in your life. But going back... So much to 2019 it and was I wonder 2017. Oh, 2017 okay and mm -hmm. I wonder if during that time almost the things you were going through and the difficulty of it was exacerbated by the fact that you were with a man and a younger man rather than a woman because it's hard for men to really understand any of our physiology and as somebody who's married to a man for a lot of years you know 25 plus years 25 and a half years you don't look old enough to be married for 25 I years. I am your age I'm 52 I am your age my friend and I, so yeah and but but he's really good about it like he's really gotten the language down pat now like oh is this the perimenopause honey mm -hmm. is this the perimenopause but he doesn't really understand when my boobs start to hurt or he doesn't really understand like the bloating or the really fucking crazy weight fluctuations that are the bane of my existence. Cause I've spent the past 12 years, you know, maintaining my weight. Look, and I now, know. right now yeah. the scale wants to say to me, go fuck yourself. I don't care that you exercise and eat as little as you possibly can. I hate you. Like it's just mean and cruel. But for but you, also, Katie, I yeah. just, I just got to jump in here because I know, you know, you have talked so much about your weight loss journey and sure. the way that you take care of yourself and your health. Uh, two things that I just – myths that we need to di di just discuss. Yeah. Menopause is not what causes weight gain, okay? okay. Uh, um, menopause usually is – what you start to see in menopause is body weight redistribution. Mm. That's when we get the menopause middle. Uh, yeah. We start to lose muscle. That's due to loss of estrogen, right? Okay. Just, just to be clear. But aging in general, we're less mobile and our metabolisms do Changes slow down. It's the bit. aging process that really has more to do with weight gain. Okay. And um, a lot of doctors, you know, talk about all of the different things that we can do in midlife to kind of restart our metabolism. And is it, you know, intermittent fasting or is it a Mediterranean diet? And you know, my sister, Jacqueline. London, Love her. She's going to be on this She's too. Love her. Yeah. Oh, can, I'm sorry. Please hold. That's the salad arriving. That's <laughs> you can get a salad, of course. Well, uh, while you get the salad, I'm gonna because this is real life for me. Uh, I, I love what what Stacy just said about 
menopause and it's aging rather than just perimenopause and menopause that causes the weight gain. And to sort of agree with that, but expand on that, there is a difference in terms of how much fluid we retain. So I think it looks like it's weight gain when often it's fluid retention. It's fluid and, retention. And so it feels like it's weight, even though it's, or it feels like it's fat, even though it's not. It's a it's a weird thing that our bodies are transitioning, especially in perimenopause, because I've heard after menopause, after you go through perimenopause, that in menopause, things can calm down a little bit. Sure. And look, I just want to also be clear that post-menopause is still menopause. So once you right. are in peri, right. right, or pre in for some people, yeah. you are you are now menopausal for the rest of your life. That doesn't mean <laughs> so that you're fun. going to have vasomotor symptoms, right? Which is really what we experience in perimenopause, which are the ones that we all know. The hot flashes, the brain fog, the night sweats, the weight gain, or the body weight redistribution, the water retention, all of that stuff can calm down. But one of the things that I am so hell bent on mm -hmm. talking about is what post menopausal means, right? Yes. We talk about menopause mentors and I'm like, look, getting through those symptoms doesn't mean that menopause doesn't play a role in your life. Sure. I want you to care about what is happening to you 40 to 60 and really understand what's happening in your hormonal life because it is really going to matter how well you live from 60 to 90. God right? willing. Okay. Go back to 2017. Go Sorry. back there. So We're now you're in 2017. Right. Your body's changing. You notice it's changing. Nobody's talking about it. Cause I'd argue in 2022, we're just now scratching the surface because all these famous superstars that we've been watching forever are about to go through menopause. So they're now talking about it cause they're freaked out. And yeah. so it's becoming part of the kind of conversation. Well, so what, what happened? Look, but out of the personal comes the universal. Right. I, I would never be in the position that I'm in now running a menopause company if I hadn't been so completely floored by the dearth of information that I could find nothing that helped me. I had, I love my doctors, but they were very dismissive about menopause. They were yep. very dismissive about the fact that I couldn't take hormones. Yep. And now looking back, I don't know whether that was because of this 2002 study that vilified hormones that was completely misinterpreted and really um, put women through so much unnecessary pain and stress because doctors stopped prescribing hormones with absolutely no real reason. Now, of course, there are certain people that cannot take hormones. And as it turns out, like I am probably one of them. There Damn. is a risk of breast cancer for some people. But even I spoke with a doctor yesterday that said some people who have breast cancer in remission do go on hormones. You, mm -hmm. There just isn't enough information, clinical research or data for us to be saying across the board, this is what you need to do. This is a bio-individual experience. 100%. And while we can give you you know, sort of, this is probably the time frame. This is going to happen. Perimenopause usually happens somewhere between 38 and 50 and 51 is probably when you're going to lose your period for a year. And that's when you're really at, at that's post-menopause, right? If yep. you go without uh, your period for a year, you are now post-menopausal, but post-menopausal, we have to think about cardiac health, bone health, cognitive health, and, and really hormone fluctuation affects these things for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of positive reasons to be on hormones, but there are a lot of reasons that people don't want to be on hormones. One, they don't feel comfortable. They just don't want to do it. Two, they have a health profile that doesn't allow them to. Or three, they can't afford it. Right. They, don't, they may not even have, be able to afford, afford insurance that can right. cover it. So what are the other ways that we can manage this? First, education. We still we'll, haven't gone to 2017. We're going to get back there in okay, one second. Okay, good. Okay. The, but the most important thing, and this is about 2017, was that I had no knowledge or education. I did not know what was happening to me. So I did mental gymnastics to pretend that everything that was happening to me, I could explain. And that the two tentpole events that I keep talking about happened to me at the end of 2016. Mm -hmm. I had pretty massive spine surgery, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm titanium. I'm a little bit bionic now. <laughs> but after that surgery, I remember my anxiety started to go through the roof. The first yeah. time I saw an x-ray with all that foreign material in my body, I yeah. flipped out. I'm sure. And I was constantly, like so emotional, very big, like, teary, crying all the time. The only way that I could describe it to my boyfriend at the time was that I felt like something was eating me alive from the inside out. 
And our relationship was completely falling apart. And yes, he was much younger than me. And one of the things that, you know, I felt was that like, we didn't have a spark in our relationship mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, like, what, what's gone wrong? What's happened? What's gone wrong? And he said to me, you know, I'm not really attracted to you anymore because you've lost all your confidence. Oh. Now, that is a hard thing to hear, and it is probably not the best way to say it, but I can't disagree mm -hmm. because the fact is I started to feel like a completely different person. I did. I lost all my confidence. I never associated this kind of crisis of confidence with hormone fluctuation. Oh my gosh. I don't yeah. think of my feelings as being generated. Oh yeah. By hormones, right? Yeah. Well, hold on. Yeah. No, I mean that, see, I think because that's the kind of stuff that I'm super aware of that it's, that it's so maddening to me because there's this part of me that thinks, well, if I've got this cognition and I know this and intellectually I get it, why can't I talk myself down or through the hormonal stuff? Why do I have that thing eating me from the outside? Like that feeling of despondence or just, it's like an unshakable ick and, and no matter how hard you try. And yes, there are things you can do like exercise can really often shift, but it doesn't always shift. Not it can always. shift it a little bit so that I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'm going to actually murder somebody, but it doesn't shift enough anymore that I feel relief. I might've felt even two years ago. It's, it's nothing is as definitive, potent. right. Yeah. Or potent because. Yeah. And, and look, exercise hormones, is always oh, going to give you some yeah, endorphins, yeah, yeah. right? But it really is. I think it's much more that we are connecting these things intellectually right? so that we can figure out what our best choices are to, to change our feelings, to change our physicality, to change the circumstances in a way that makes sense, right? The idea that I had no idea that was, I just assumed it was my surgery that was causing right. of the, course. Night sweat, the anxiety. Because, yeah. you know, You're like, there's titanium in, in me. It's making me sad. Right. I can't have stuff weird. in my body. What am I supposed to do? This is toxicity. I, right. Exactly. I had such a short fuse. I was always upset. And of right. course, that really did cause uh, huge problems in my relationship, not just romantically, with friends, with sure. family. I just, I, I felt so much unlike myself that I was yeah. concerned about my mental health. I yes. had such bad brain fog. I was concerned oh. I had early Alzheimer's. I just had no idea. And I remember my doctor saying, look, this could be menopause, but you'll get through it. That was the explanation. Yeah. That's just and an I, awful sentence. Like, that's just like, this is that. And so what? Like, yeah, and so what? Right. And I thought, well, okay, maybe I'm overreacting. Nobody else is taking this quite as seriously. And it took about 18 months to do the PT to recover from that spine surgery yeah. in a way that I felt strong, oh. physically strong again. And just as that was happening, you know, my father had been diagnosed seven years before with amyloidosis of the heart, which is a very rare condition in um, uh, somebody with his genetic profile. Wow. He had something called acquired wild type. Uh -huh. Nobody knows the origin. Nobody knows how he got it. But essentially, amyloid plaques are amyloids. We all have amyloids. They are proteins in the body that can usually pass through tissue and bloodstream because of the way that they are shaped. They're small and round okay. and they pass through. When you have amyloidosis, those proteins become flat and they mm -hmm. can't pass through tissue and they start to build up on each other. And the reason I bring this up is because amyloidosis of the heart essentially means that your heart is being strangled by the fact that the walls uh, get so thick around it. Yes. But amyloid plaques are also what happens to the brain during menopause. Now, they are a marker for Alzheimer's and dementia. They are not a, an indicator of, but this is something that, this is why it's so important for us postmenopausally to be aware of what is going on with our cog cognition. Yes. And I would highly recommend Dr. Lisa Moscone. Love her. Uh, she's been on the show a bunch. When I had the show on Sirius XM, she's been on the show yeah. a bunch. I really she's fantastic. like her. She's so smart. And, and so good at explaining. Yeah. Did um, you go the, to the brain center at Cornell? No, I did not go to the okay. brain center. I didn't. I didn't even know about the brain center at okay. Cornell, right? This is like, I mean, I'm still floating around thinking this is my, yeah. this is my spine. And then all of a sudden I'm watching my dad. I'm watching my dad get really sick, really yeah. ill. Yeah. And that started in March of 2018 and he passed away in November of 2018. And it was mm. very 
a, a very quick descent. And I was spending all of my time with him. And I started to notice that he would have symptoms that I would then get as well. He was you know, experiencing heart disease, all of a sudden I had heart palpitations. Right. He would get a skin rash. I would get a skin rash. His right. muscles would hurt. I, Symbiotic. My, yeah. And I thought, oh my God, this is the physical manifestation of grief. So you've got the surgery that's physical trauma on one side, the emotional trauma of losing my <sighs> father on the other. But all of these symptoms I come to learn are actually perimenopausal. Now, both of these events probably amplified what was already a very stressful hormonal time for me. But those symptoms, nonetheless, yeah. were perimenopausal. And yeah. nobody explained that to me. Yeah. So I felt really, when, when I was approached, uh, again, uh, it's sort of at the end of 2018, um, by a company that was starting to talk about creating a line of products for menopause called yep. menopause, mm -hmm. I became a beta tester because I thought, oh my God, thank God, they're going to start making products that help. So, okay, wait, hold on. So now it's 2018. Yes. You, you, you lose the boyfriend, you lose your father, you're losing your period. This is all I happening. Lost, I lost my period January of 2017. I had my period twice and I never saw it again. Okay. Vista, baby. Yeah, no. So then my so that would mean you were 47, 46, 48? Yeah, something somewhere around Somewhere in there. there. Okay. So this is a lot at once, right? This is a lot to go through in one fell swoop. That's a lot of loss. Not that losing your period is something that we have to mourn, I don't think, because it's like the night we're not dead. It's the next phase of no, a, a woman's but, but life. I, it's just but change. I, yes, but I would argue that every, not everyone, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I never really wanted children, but right. that's not the point. I think we all grieve when our body stops, you know, all natural Changes, processes yeah. have an end. Sure. But I think that there is a feeling of loss and yeah. grief that comes along with thinking like, oh, that ship has sailed. Like uh, right. that opportunity is never coming back. You know, Jennifer Aniston just talked about this in I her saw. interview. Oh my gosh. It was really yeah. quite poignant. It it's was. not a question of whether or not you wanted children or not wanted children. Mm -hmm. When you are no longer, when that is no longer a biological option, there is a moment of, uh, of true loss. And, and, and I honestly believe we should honor that. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you wanted children. It's like saying goodbye to anything is a moment. Brings up feelings. Pleasure. Yes. Ag agreed. I agree with you. Um, but so this is a lot at once. Okay. So even more, so that's com compounded loss. It's like one relationship, this, that, and now you find yourself sort of in a way, and you didn't say this, I'm saying it for you in a way, almost desperate to find some sort of help because obviously yeah. you're at, you've hit a bottom in a way. Oh, sure. But I, I didn't know that, right. Okay. I just knew that I felt like, uh, you know, don't, I don't want to walk across a bridge in case I throw myself off. I get of that. No, I get, you know, by the I way, mean, I get that feeling and it's not, I'm not making light of actual real suicidal ideation. No, no, but, but the, but I have gone through moments where I've looked at myself or I've looked at my husband and I've said, and the reason I say I've looked at my husband because I, I've isolated myself at this point. I don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah. I want my world to be as teeny, teeny, tiny as it possibly can because everything else feels too painful. And yes. I will say to him, I don't know where my personality is and I don't know where my joy is. Mm -hmm. And it's a very strange feeling. I want to be alive. I'd like to find my joy. But I know there's this overwhelming, looming hormonal thing that's going on in my body stirring up this it's it's a it's horrible it's like it's it's very hard and, yeah. and I think it's not the same for everybody. Again, sure. I don't want to, you know, I, I'm one, I remember a young millennial clapped back at me on, on, um, Instagram and said, you know, you're using scare tactics about menopause. And I was oh, like, please. Oh, my angel. No, oh, my, exactly. Don't you just you want know, honestly, when, like, when I, the young whippersnappers, Stacy, I just want to be like, let me just come, come a little closer. Yeah. Come a little closer. Let me just smack you. Like, yeah. please. And not even that. I was like, I just don't want you to think of this as scare tactics. I want right. you to think of this as prepare tactics. Of course. Psychologically speaking, if you know what is coming before it shows up, you won't have to do mental gymnastics. Correct. You, you won't be scared. Happening. That's and right. And now you That's should right. have more education around what your choices are to do about totally. it. Totally. Right? That's yes. what we don't have. And right. there's a real disconnect between knowing 
that something is happening to you and feeling like you have agency over it from the beginning and feeling yeah. desperate like there's no rope to cling to. There's no yeah. branch to grab, you know, so that you're not to help drowning. you up. So now, yeah. okay, so now you meet the people from State of Menopause and they say, right. let's have you just try this stuff. Let us know how you like it. Now, at this point, had you already met your partner or that was not yet? Yes, no. Okay. Um, so I, I guess the original conversations that I had with State of Menopause were before State of Menopause existed as a brand. It was it. Uh, another company called Arfa. So that probably happened uh, early in 2018, now that okay. I think about it, which was before I met Kat, who is my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And um, and I broke up with my boyfriend in 2017. So I was really spending all of my time with my father in 2018. I mean, I, I stopped doing anything else and, sure. and spent most days with Makes him sense. or my, and my family. Um, and it was, you know, I'm really very, very grateful for that time looking back. Um, I don't regret that decision. I may have missed out on some opportunities, you know, work-wise, but who cares? Like, who cares? I will yeah. never, ever regret that I had that time it's a beautiful with my father. Thing. Right. Um, and then, you know, after he passed away, I really started to do a lot more homework about what I was feeling because I was like, I'm experiencing grief. I was also, I had just started dating Kat and I was, you know, experiencing this like kind of falling in love feeling at the same time, feeling guilty about being happy, feeling guilty oh. about missing my dad, you know, all oh. of these emotions at once that were, I think, also compounded by the fact that I had no idea what was going on with me physically. Yeah. And that really took a lot of work on my part to understand. Yeah. That took a lot of research and a lot of questioning. And it wasn't like you could just Google it and it would immediately come up. No. There's a lot of conflicting information. So, so much. Yeah, so much. So and like you, testosterone or estrogen, which patch is the right patch for you? Which one won't kill you? Which one makes you fat? Which one makes you thin? Which one keeps you weight neutral? It is everything contradicts everything, everything else, else. And it have progesterone, no estrogen. What? Like, yeah. Well, I yeah. would highly recommend, actually, I did an interview last night that is now on our Instagram, okay. uh, our, our IGTV with Dr. Susan Hardwick-Smith, who okay. is an OBGYN and a certified menopause practitioner. She stopped delivering babies really just to focus on people in midlife yeah. who are experiencing this. And, and, and she did a very good job of breaking down how we think about hormones, what the delivery mechanism is, what yeah. is FDA approved and what isn't. Does it matter? if it's FDA approved, because a lot of people love mm. the naturopathic route that is not FDA approved, that's separate from hormones. But what is confusing about hormones is that all of the hormones are FDA approved. The delivery mechanisms for those hormones are yeah. not all FDA approved. Oh so gosh. that's where you really, again, need to sit with somebody who is a menopause specialist. There is only two hours of menopause medical training in medical school for GPs. And there's like one day for gynecologists. It's outrageous. I mean, it's it's so outrageous. Yeah. yeah. It's outrageous. But again, of course, because when we look at the state of healthcare, when it comes to female physiology, we've just been left in the dust. It wasn't until 1992 or 93 that women were had to be in all physical studies. We are uh -huh. not little men. No. So we are diagnosed across hundreds of diseases four to six years later on average than men. And we don't understand menopause because it hasn't been studied enough. Right. You know, these are the things that, I mean, are legislative and monetary that we need to start talking about. And, you know, big pharma is coming for menopause. All of these things need infinitely more research so that you and I, as just your average consumers, mm -hmm. have a much better handle on what we decide to do with our bodies, right? Yeah. This is, at the end of the day, about reproductive justice. I mean, this is bodily autonomy. This is not just about whether or not you are, you know, can make the decision to have an abortion. This mm -hmm. is about what do I want to do for my physical health Yes. after my reproductive years. Right, right. You're not... So now, okay. In the beginning. So now... You, you you come across this this company. They're a different company at the time. They say, try these out. See how they make you feel. Yeah. And what happens to you? So I really loved the products. And I was one of 100 beta testers that really like went through kind of the rigmarole of testing all of the new formulations and things like that. And originally, you know, they had started off with skincare. 
-hmm. And I think that that is now, you know, two years into this, I really understand that a lot of uh, companies that are approaching menopause do start with things that feel more beauty related Mm -hmm. in terms of the kind of symptoms that they are, are trying to mitigate simply because you can go through FDA approved ingredients. You're not making claims that nobody can prove, you know, that there it's a, it's, it's the easy way in. Yes. And also it makes it a more palatable conversation for a lot of people to have, because let's be honest, a lot of people either are just totally ignorant about the topic or they're ashamed yes. or they're afraid. Yes. And all of those things make us like ostriches and we stick our head in the sand oh. and just pray for the best. Right. right. So the, the skincare I thought was great right? Your skin gets very, very dry as progesterone and estrogen start to decrease. And that was very important to me because I really, those were the first two things that I saw. My mood changed and my skin changed like Mm -hmm. drastically. I started to get cystic acne. Then I would have like skin that felt like sandpaper. Like I, and again, whatever you were using before is not going to cut it when you get to menopause. Like, no. that, like let's just be clear. Everything shifts. It changes. Everything your body changes. Your new skin red. texture changes. Your hair changes. The way you physiologically feel like it all shifts. It all shifts. Yeah. That means you need to find a new regimen and a new way for taking care of yourself. And, you know, again, this was the beginning of that for me. And what it essentially happened was that ARFA decided they didn't want to do um, – product that they wanted to stay in technology and build customizable platforms for brands like mine. So what I did when they said they were going to shutter the company was I was like, oh, no, 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 no. We we can't lose a company that's focus is on consumer products for menopause. Like we have to keep this going. So my answer to doing that was to buy the majority share of the company. And become CEO, which again- Watching you become a CEO, and I know this life because for bunny eyes, for my glasses, like it, to do the work that you do as a personality and people look to you for advice about all kinds of things. I don't care whether you're on what not to wear or not. People are still going to come to you and say, well, but what do I do about wearing this? And I have to go to that. And what do I, oh, so absolutely. it doesn't matter whether you're on, t- you're still doing your, in a way, in influencing, which wasn't a word at the time when you started right. styling people, but this is how it is now. And uh, so now you have like double detail in a sense, plus you're going through all this and so many changes in your life. So how did you, well, I know part of the way you navigated it was by being super open online, which I thought, again, Stacey London was and is the coolest, most um, appealing thing that you show up and you were just like, I'm having a horrible day being CEO. This sucks. And I was like, it so sucks. Like it, it, so was, sucks. it was like it the sucks. greatest moment because I think so many women saw you here you are with a company you believe in you bought into your ceo you're doing all the work you're using the products and believe in them you're surrounding yourself with excellent people i'm sure and still this all sucks and so talk about that decision to be so candid because i think for many people that level of vulnerability is terrifying and I don't know that that level of vulnerability is for everybody. You know, I, right. there are lots of times where I was like, oh my God, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to scare off investors or I'm going to, I'm going to scare uh, off. They're not the right investors if they're not going to, right. Company because yeah. I feel it's not even really imposter syndrome, right? Nobody is born no. a CEO, but here I did not go to business school. Okay. I had to teach myself about e-commerce. I had mm-hmm. to teach myself about product. I had mm-hmm. to teach myself about direct to consumer. I had to teach myself about marketing. I had to teach myself about inventory management, all of these things were fucking awful. Uh Like I I was like, I, I thought that being CEO, I would find it like a great operator and I would become chief evangelist officer, which is essentially what I'm great at doing. Right. When I realized, oh my God, there's, there's no help coming. Right. You know, I, I mean, that's not to say I don't work with great people. No, 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 but you're right. And, and I got to tell you, you don't, there, I've, I've studied founders because I find it fascinating how people succeed and how, when they succeed and when they don't. And the thing that's universal is that no two stories are alike. So you do have the MBA studied it well, does, has a business plan and investors at the jump. And then you have someone who just walks in. And then the still falls apart. Correct. There's all different. And there are some people like you or like me who have zero background in in training in e-commerce and their companies blow up. So it's not one 
There is no, one way. There's no one right way. But yeah. I think, you know, somebody said to me, and I, I really took it as a compliment. And actually, one of the things that like I really could hear and internalize was she said to me, I think that you're confidently vulnerable. Mm. We feel, and I thought, oh my God, what a nice way to put it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not always how I feel. But I she's right. Feel that you are that oddly idea. centered. You were yeah. centered in your falling apart. Yeah. So it wasn't, so it wasn't like this is just. And there's another trope, the hysterical female. You were sort of like. Well, that's so funny that you say that, Jenny, because I was actually thinking my next book is going to be called Hysterical. I have right? no problem with because that. Because it's like, th yeah. this is the way we treat women when it they is. have emotional, like, crises. This is mm -hmm. the way we. You're and, crazy. And the fact is, You're hysterical. And also, yeah. Right. And we're also, it is hysterical because it's so funny that people think that, like, having an, any kind of emotional yeah. uh, depth to you is somehow a problem. Right. right. You, a deficit. I, it's exactly. a freaking deficit. Yeah. I think it's ridiculous. But yes. I, do, I, I think that I was candid even before the company, right? I have been, you know, I, I was candid on what not to wear when I really um, empathized with a particular, uh, you know, guest that we had on the show. I was always quick to identify that because I really do believe that empathy is the strongest means of communication, yes. truly, yes. right? When somebody can relate to exactly what you're saying, when they speak the same language as you, there is an immediate sense of identification and a certain sense of safety yeah. that you are relating to somebody who really has That's your back, it. who yeah. really understands. Yeah. And so I started to do that on what not to wear, but I also started to do that when I did Love Lester Run. And mm -hmm. I definitely started to do that after I lost my father. My mm -hmm. grief was the most complicated emotion I had ever experienced. I did not know which way was up. Mm -hmm. I felt so completely, like I, I used to say, I felt like a, a six-year-old that got lost their parents in a grocery store, mm -hmm. right? I was just like, you know, in a huge supermarket with like aisles and aisles and you're just frantically running around looking for somebody's hand to hold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dad wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I had to be honest about that one because I am convinced that, as I said before, the universal comes from the individual. And if you are able to really understand your individual experience, and Jenny, this is why I think what you have gone through and what you have shared with your audience is so incredibly important, is that we do not feel alone. No. And one mm -hmm. thing that definitely happens as we age is we do get our, our circles get smaller. Yep. Our friend circles get smaller. We see, yep. you know, we start to lose our family members, like our parents, things like that. Middle age is a very tricky, complicated, and fascinating time. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of things that I would say is that, you know, I will never stop being open and candid and, 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 and definitely even being CEO of a company. I don't know if this is something I'm going to keep doing. It's really hard. Maybe this isn't for me, but what I've learned in the last two years has taught me so much about what needs to happen in this vertical, in this market, mm -hmm. what we need to be doing as Gen X women to really set people up for um, next generations That's when it right. comes to their health, when it comes to their well-being, when it comes yeah. to what it means to live well. I think we're looking at a lot of new trends that yeah. are going to take place. Like everybody was like, <gasps> menopause. It's the new, it's menopause is having its moment. First of all, I don't want it to have a moment. I if agree. it's a moment, it's a trend. Right. It's absurd. We want this to be part of the zeitgeist. Right. We, exactly. Want, part of the conversation. Yes. Right. The same way you talk about sex ed. You just it said something be really smart though, Stacey, about midlife yeah. that I think, I think what you're talking about, it is really complicated it is really strange. And again, it's that same thing of it's not really ever talked about other than the whole midlife crisis. How is this person going to behave in a midlife crisis? Oh, they're having a midlife crisis. But if we change the lens, if we look at it like what an exciting time, what a different time, what's mm. happening in this time, maybe it's a lovely thing that you distill <sighs> down who's meant to be in your life or the new people then you bring into your life. Maybe that's part of it. And there is an almost natural passing of the baton. Like I yeah. used to think about how with, I would see other mothers with their daughter, cause I have a daughter and I have a son and I would see other mothers with their daughters, like competing with their daughters. And um. I, 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 I'm like, I just want to pass the baton. Like I just, I want her to have all the cool, young, hip, be a woman. You know what I mean? Like that different. Yeah. And, and I get to go into the sunset, not dead, but like, 
having a different kind of fun. Well, and, and why and not I see it like that? I agree with you a little bit there. Okay, okay tell I, me why. I mean, I, I agree about passing the baton. Of course, every generation has to have its moment in the sun. Yeah. But I don't think that that means that you're heading towards the sunset, right? What I really <laughs> believe, honestly, in the last 20 years alone, yeah. look at what we've learned about health. Just in, right. you know, everybody's live, counting right. their steps every day, right? Yeah, every day. I mean, like every you day. have extended your lifespan just by what you've learned that we know that sitting is the new smoking, all oh, of that's that the stuff, worst. Right? Yeah. So this idea that we in midlife are somehow moving towards the sunset, if you're comparing yourself to a 20 year old, sure. Yeah. Right. But the fact is Gen X is unlike generations before us. We're, we're not going down so easy, right? right. And all right. of the things that, that we allowed or yeah. that, that generations before just assumed are not true about Gen X. And let me, let me explain why. I always say we have one foot in the kind of traditional industrial revolution, mm -hmm. you know, family unit. Somebody went to work. Somebody stayed home with the kids. Mm -hmm. We remember rotary phones. Mm -hmm. We remember when you went to school. Maybe you went to college. Maybe yeah. you didn't. You got yeah. a job. Then you got married. Then you had kids. Then you got another job. Then you got the corner office. Then you retired. Then you went to Florida and you died. No <laughs> one lives that linear life. No, Very not few anymore. People right. still live that linear life. We have too many options. So our other foot is in this kind of technological revolution where we can order food differently. We can date differently. We can work remotely. Plus, we've also just been through a massive, crazy, life-changing pandemic. I right? know. So think about all of these things. The way the world has changed, we have got to take our view of middle age out of the middle ages and you know, drag it into the modern age. Yeah. This is the middle of your story. This is not the end. This right. is the best part of the book. This is where the It can be. I see what you're saying and it can be. And I want to give you this moment also to like talk about state of menopause because you do have products that are helping women feel better. And that's the point of it. It's not medicine. Yeah. It's, it's, it's working sort of from the outside in to make you feel better during in this moment. time of upheaval in our bodies. And look, I, I would say products are kind of beside the point. <laughs> Even though that's my company, I'm going to be really honest. No, that's okay. I, I want you to be because yeah. that's why we're it, here. Yeah. There are a glut of new menopause companies that are coming on the market, right? And just like the fact that you don't wear one designer, you're probably going to use some of my products and a bunch of other companies as well. My real goal is that you know why you're buying these products. Mm -hmm. My goal is for you to be so educated that you know what choices are best for you. Mm -hmm. My goal is to curate information for you so that when you don't feel decision fatigue when it comes to understanding how to manage menopause, because you will have straightforward, honest information, immersive experiences, ways in which to understand this stage of life that have never been presented to you before. Yeah. That is what I'm interested in doing. Okay. And yes, what I offer is you know, naturopathic, like this is not, we are not using hormones. We're not contraindicated with hormones. But what I say, we are a, acute symptomatic relief. In the moment, if you are experiencing something like extremely dry skin, breast tenderness. Oh God, the breast tenderness. Right? The yeah. breast tenderness. We have a CBD oil that is great for muscle fatigue. I mean, yeah. Tenderness. And because honestly, like the breast tenderness is supposed to go away when you get your period. It's not supposed to come right back a day later because your body decides it wants to ovulate again. And so your boobs are going to kill every yeah. time you inadvertently touch them. And I'm one of those women that's always palpating herself anyway, because I'm nuts. Well, it's also because your estrogen, as you go into perimenopause can actually be high. It can oh, be yeah, no, it, it's, it's, right. Yeah. So, and that's what causes breast tenderness. So, so oh. one of the things that we like to say is like, look, I'm, whether or not you, you know, your estrogen is high and you need more progesterone or you're, you're going to take hormones again, not everybody has that option. Yep. So what can we do in the moment to relieve some of that tenderness? This is an, a, you know, external applicable to your boobs mm -hmm. kind of oil mm -hmm. that, that will help relieve some of the pain. Yeah. That's one of the things we also have an Arnica cream that's for like, you know, stiff joints. Yeah. We also have cooling spray for hot flashes, things like that, so that are great. in the moment yep. meant to help. They are at a price point that most people can afford. We wanted to do something that was economically democratic because again, when it comes to healthcare, 
you see the injustice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the minute you look at a stigmatized topic like menopause and you really go down that rabbit hole, you see that sexism is ageism and you realize, or that ageism is sexism, sexism. And, that, and that frankly, there is ableism involved here. There is racism involved oh, yeah. here. There oh, is yeah. no, no concept of socioeconomic diversity. Oh, yeah. And we are not looking at the fact that menopause also, the way that we experience menopause is sort of how we have been treated, you know, childhood trauma plays into menopause. So many things. A I, everything. To, I, you you everything. hear it female, women to women because I'll, I'll say to somebody, this is the first time I'm like, I'm at 50, I'm 52 and I'm still getting my period. It feels like a humble brag. I want you to know it feels <laughs> like a humble brag, which is messed up. But like, I, I hear, right. And I hear someone else be like, well, I get my period every month too. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't care. Like this was not a judgment on whether somebody's period has ended or not ended. Like and it's not I, a contest. Oh my God, it's not a contest. And I, I had one month so far where my period was late by two weeks and I, it was the most uncomfortable, miserable experience. And then my period was normal for two months, but I know it's going to then go away and come back and go away and then be gone for good. I don't yeah. care whether it's now or a year from now. And, and I say humble brag only because I'm aware that some people think there's some sort of weird, like youth. So I'm aging, I'm yeah. aging just like the rest of you. Like I'm as wrinkled and a mess as I could possibly be. I just still have my period and right. it's, it's debilitating now. It's not well, even like it's gross. <laughs> Yeah. And also I would say, look, of course you can have your period in perimenopause, right? So people can get, no, still get pregnant in perimenopause. Yes. Just, I just want to be clear. Yeah. It wouldn't so be a good thing. Once yeah. your period starts to <laughs> become slightly irregular or yep. heavier or you're yep. skipping months, like that's a pretty good indication that, of you course. know, you are in some phase of perimenopause. Yeah. And look, being 52 doesn't mean that like, you know, the average age, right. At which people experience menopause, the cessation of menstruation is around 51. Yeah. You may not have, you know, I know people who have gone through menopause as late as 62. Right. There, there is no rhyme or reason. Yeah. The point is, as long as you understand like, Hey, I don't feel the way I used to feel. Something mm -hmm. feels off. Of course. Right? That's when you need to start paying attention to your own instincts. Yeah. And any one of the symptoms that we associate with menopause, and there are 34 common ones, and I highly recommend Electra Health's 21st Century Guide to Menopause to okay. really educate yourself about what those symptoms look like. I love like. that. Yeah. Highly recommend it because then you start to connect the dots because you're not necessarily going to think that food allergies and insomnia have anything to do with each other. Oh, yeah. So oh, breast yeah. tenderness, right? Of course. And forgetfulness of course. Has anything to do with each yeah. other. Yeah. And then but basically you... hormones rule everything, everything. about a body, our, Ev our bodies. Everything. It's just, it's, yeah, it's wild. And if we could connect those dots sooner, rather, first of all, you know, what I was saying before is that any one of these symptoms by itself is easily dismissible. I'm stressed out. You know, I'm worrying about my parents. I'm worrying about my kids. I'm worrying about my job, right? This is 45 to 55. Scientific American did a study that said it's the highest rate of decreased earning potential for women, highest rate of divorce, highest rate of depression. Yeah. And that is not by accident. No, it's not. Right? And right. so when we start to think about these things, oh stop thinking about those things as like, oh, well, uh, it's because, you know, women get pushed out of the workforce. Well, it's also because one out of 10 women is leaving work to deal with menopause. With the symptoms. It's so true and how liberating it'll be. And it is to talk about it because then we realize, wait, it doesn't have to be that story. And it does not have to be that story. Yeah. Exactly what you said before, Jenny, is really, I, I feel like my, truly my life mission is how do we just shift perspective enough to go from like fear to curiosity, mm -hmm. from worry to wonder, when we can look at this stage as a natural transition, not a disease, mm -hmm. and think about all of the possibility. When we think about the idea that we're going to get to live, let's say, into our 80s or 90s, God willing, right? That really now women also tend to, you know, or people with female physiology tend to live longer than those who uh, have male physiology. Yep. Um, I don't want you to think about the end, right? At the end, you're going to get old. You're going to, you know, maybe you'll be sick. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll die in your sleep. Who knows? Maybe you'll die in a hang gliding accident. You just don't know. Who knows? I know but I'm not dying in a hand gliding accident, but anything else, keep going. Anything else, whatever. My point is that the time that we're actually gaining is now. Right. The time that we're actually gaining in our lives is in the middle. 
Yeah. This gives us the potential not just to extend our lifespan, but to extend our health span. Right. So that we stop saying, oh, we're old at 45, we're old at 55, we're old at 65. No. You have the resources now to take care of your body and your mind and your spirit well into your 80s so that you can still be living a healthy, happy life, right? The idea is to live well, not die well, right. like live well. Yeah. And that means having to shift this idea of menopause as an ending into a transition and a beginning uh, because this yeah. is the moment of self-actualization. I am convinced. Well, it certainly is for you. And I think that's the other thing. I think watching you and and paying attention to sort of your whole life journey that you've shared with so many of us thus far is super empowering because I'm always like inspired by somebody living their best life. And I, I don't mean to take from Oprah the concept of your best life, but like it is that like, mm -hmm. I see you really doing things, really living whatever life you deem you want to live. And that is the most to me exciting thing because I always have this feeling of, oh, well, if, if she could do it, then why can't I? And exactly. I think, right? And I think that's exactly. one of the greatest gifts we can give the younger generation is to see women our age doing the things so they're not afraid to try it themselves. And I, and I, you know, Jenny, the, the key word there is doing, Yeah. right? It's yeah. showing. It's not always saying. It's not no, always no. talking. No, no, it's no. About it's how are we living our lives in a way yeah. that is an example to people that there is no stopping us at a certain age, that there is constant regeneration yeah. in our thoughts and in the way that we behave and in the way that we can continue, you know, um, Dr. Frank Lipman, who uh -huh. I, I think Friend you know. Friend of mine too, yeah. Yes. Wrote a book called, um, right. you know, How to Be Well. Yep. And if you look at those pillars, right, we know sleep hygiene is important. We know nutrition yeah. is important. We yeah. know, um, you know, that, uh, that exercise is important. But the other things that are important is to constantly stay curious. The other yeah. things that are important are to keep making friends or yep. maintaining friendships, having community, because without those things, it is very easy to get isolated. It is very easy to get inside your head and feel yeah. alone. Yeah. And this is the most important time for us to kind of, you know, kind of come together and really celebrate each other. It's one of the reasons that um, you know, State of Menopause hosted 14 companies, some of which are direct competitors for a menopause CEO summit. I had Love 18 that. different CEOs there because some oh. companies have co-CEOs. Wow. And the whole point was to discuss that this category isn't, it's not established enough for us to be fighting each other for a sure. piece of The pie is huge, yeah. right? One billion people in menopause. Incredible. In yeah. What are we worrying? I don't want to fight for scraps. No. I don't care about that. Yeah. If we, you know, come, come together, bind together as one voice, one amplified voice, we are an industry to be reckoned with. We are here in service of this consumer, not that we are fighting for her attention, that we are, you know, we're, we're fighting to educate her so that she has agency and choice. I love that. That to me felt like a much bigger deal and also something that Gen X has never done before, right? Yeah. We've been taught to be competitive our whole lives. There's mm -hmm. you know, one job worth getting. There's one partner worth having. So There's ridiculous. One, you've got to be the one, yeah. number one, it's first absurd. Place, yeah. person, whatever it is. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah. What if we you know, all came together in service of something bigger than each of our I companies. That. that is not to say no, everybody wants a successful company. Of course we all do, but there's something bigger at stake here. Yeah. And the more that I've uncovered about menopause and the confusion around it and the fear around it, the more I realize, like, it's not just my voice. We need all the voices. Mm -hmm. We're so lucky that we've got people that are really starting to come out and talk about this now. Michelle, Michelle Obama. It's incredible. I know. Menopause. I what? know. I know it's the coolest thing. It's before, the coolest thing yeah. Ever. Before I let you go, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask what's in the salad. Oh God. Okay. So uh, braised chicken thigh. Okay. Uh, That's uh, really specific. I, yeah. Yeah. I know. I love. I love chicken thigh. Okay. So I like. I always have braised Didn't. chicken thigh. Mm -hmm. um, uh, creamy vegan feta. Perfect. Avocado mash. Crisp romaine. I do sort of like a balsamic vinaigrette. Um, and crispy onions. 
Oh, gluten that's good. Free, crispy onion. And no, so gluten free, no dairy, no nightshades, no tomato. No nightshades, no gluten, no dairy. Because I have a ton of autoimmune diseases. Yeah, but yeah. Also, I would just say that that stuff is is also quite helpful in menopause. A yeah. lot of people find their gluten tolerance goes down in menopause. Something yeah. to consider. Yeah. If you want to think about inflammation, bodily inflammation overall. Highly recommend turmeric or curcumin. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you've all heard. Uh, this listen, before. I'm having your sister on because I want to talk to Jacqueline about like, how do we eat anymore? I don't know anymore. Mm -hmm. I know how to count my calories. I know how to maintain my weight. I don't know how to eat anymore. Totally but I'm different also, things. I'm, Jenny, yeah. I, I watch all of your like what I eat in a yeah. day videos. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, where do you find all this stuff? I didn't even know <laughs> half the things that you make. I'm like, what product is that? And everybody gets 10% yeah. off everything. Yeah. I'm like, how does she pull this off? I just do. I'm just, it's magical. It is uh, magical. Yeah. But I also want yeah. a list of all of these companies because frankly, <laughs> I think those are things that we should be recommending. And I, I'm like, what ice, what what's is Ralph's that? ice cream? Is that oh my God, Ralph's ice is off. It's like, they're, thank God they're seasonal. They're almost done for the year. Or they are done for the year now. And they're back in March. It's just is the it most dairy? delicious. Uh -huh. Well, some of them are not. So some of them you can have, but then the others have some dairy, but not as much dairy as ice cream. But they're not, I recommend them not at all. They're too good and you don't want them in your house. You just well, don't want them in your house. But this is the other thing I yeah. wanted to ask you. So yeah. you're not gluten and dairy free, right? I'm not. You, mm -hmm. you eat a little bit of everything. Yeah, I do. I mean, because mm -hmm. nibble bread, I <laughs> nibble bread was bread. It's gluten bread, yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. very delicious bread. It's del it's bread that's like sourdough that's freshly baked. It's really you got to make mm, it worth it if you're going to do it. A hundred percent, yeah, a hundred percent. But 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 I do find that my cravings are shifting, and it's not pretty. And I really and I have forgotten how to eat. So I it sounds silly, but it's true. Like I feel like I need a tutorial into old just how the best way to eat nutritionally speaking yes. rather than anything else. And I think that sometimes gets lost because, you know, it's also convoluted in that. It is convoluted yeah. and in some ways and yeah. in other ways it isn't. And right. like Jacqueline will be the one, my, my yeah, sister she's so, great. So, so talented yeah. will be the one to, to really she's take adorable. me through this. But yeah. at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we really always go back to this idea that the Mediterranean diet. Of course, is, is fruits, best, vegetables, lean proteins. Yeah. And this whole idea of intermittent fasting and keto yeah. and things like that for people of a certain age, I, I, I get a little nervous yeah. about things like that. Oh, yeah. No, anything that people get sort of like, this is the answer. I think it's like a, you have to get an amalgamation of all of it and sort of yeah. feel like I love the idea of having a window of, of fasting, meaning like my last bite and then I go to sleep and my body resets and my yes. digestion is slow. So I give it time. But I, I'm, it's never going to work for me to only be allowed to eat for four hours in the day. It's just not no, it's, comport it's with my not, lifestyle. It just doesn't make any sense. And yeah. also, I, do you know Dr. Will Cole? Of course. <laughs> yeah, because he's another another he's yeah. person that I, oh, I, I actually believe yeah, really he's terrific. understands um, how holistic our yeah. health is. Oh, yeah. Everything from, you know, what it means to control inflammation oh, yeah. in the body to having good friends. Oh, yeah. It's all, it all know, matters. It, it all, all matters. matters. Yeah. And I love this idea that, yeah. you know, I and I again, I, I mentioned this on a phone call yesterday and, and I feel bad and I am a little bit embarrassed. I believe that this is uh, Japanese, not Chinese. Okay. But um, in Japanese culture, there is no word for menopause. It's called second spring. <sighs> and there is something to me that oh, is so... Beautiful wonderful yeah. about that. Think about what that means. Think about the opportunity to rebloom. Yeah. Oh, right? it's gorgeous. That's, that's how we need to shift perspective. Yeah. Oh. Change is hard, but change is good. And I, if I could leave your listeners with any other thought, it would be like embrace what you don't understand. Yes. Embrace it. Just yes. embrace it. I love you that. You need to know everything to know that things are changing and that there is a way for you to come out of this feeling more fulfilled and more excited about your life than ever before. Yeah. Uh, you're just the greatest. Follow Stacy at Stacy London Real. Stacy without an E. Stacy London Real. Thank you. Without an E. Without an E. Check out stateofmenopause.com as well. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. I'm at Just Jenny Hutt on Instagram. You could also support the podcast by signing up at Patreon and uh, like this, share it, all, all the things. Thank all you again. Things. Yeah. Thanks, Jenny. So happy to be here.